Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm John Burton. I'll be presenting today on my graduate practicum at Nicholas Children's Hospital. There's a lot of us. Uh, for some reason, it seems like there's more students here. Maybe it's because I'm presenting. So. But <laughs> I'm sure that's what it is. So I would like to start just how I might start at the beginning of a session with uh, my adolescents. So um, if everyone has your hands free, um, and instead of hitting your lap, you can, always, you can tap on the desk, but just repeat after me. Okay, there we go. Here we go. Can I point at you? ourselves using body percussion. So, do you guys remember what my name is? Yes, my name is John with one syllable. So, my name is John. So that would be my body percussion for my name. Let's start here with, what is your name? Um, okay, let's repeat mine. So what was mine? John. And then what was Alicia's? Alicia. Okay. There. Okay, let's review again. John. Alicia. And so we would typically go through all of them, and then after doing body percussion, we could usually go through the whole circle and even backwards. So it's a great way to learn everyone's name and everyone to get comfortable with each other and also get moving and express yourself just a little bit and have that, that extroverted behavior. I'm going to move somewhat quickly through these slides. If you need clarification, feel free to ask. But for the majority of your questions, if you could save them for the end, that would be very helpful. So feel free to read the slides, and I'm just going to add in some comments verbally as we go through. So I'm at the psychiatric unit at Nicholas Children's Hospital, where there is an inpatient and outpatient services. Uh, typically, new patients who come in, they receive, right of admission, a medical and physical evaluation. And while they're on the unit, they will have individual counseling with a psychologist or a mental health counselor, usually on a daily basis. They also have family sessions once or twice a week, depending on how long they're there. Uh, they will receive new medication or changes to their medication, usually immediately. And there's also two group skills classes a day, which might touch on communication or anger management or coping skills. And also on weekdays, the children and adolescents on the unit have school. So that's for most of the morning and for some of the afternoon as well where the instructors come in and they have school on the, on the unit. So the patients uh, ages 5 to 17, they're typically in groups of ages 5 to 11 for the children and 12 to 17 for the adolescents. The most common diagnosis is major depressive disorder. And the reason for being admitted on the unit is a plan to harm themselves or someone else or an attempt to harm themselves or someone else, such as a suicide attempt. And I also wanted to talk about the Baker Act, uh, which is involuntary admission. So if someone is a threat uh, to themselves or someone else, then the police can be called and they can be brought to the unit against their will. And also the Marchman Act is very similar, but it's still in with substance abuse. So this is short-term stay unit, it's just for stabilization. It's a very critical time uh, for these children and adolescents, so there are a lot of safety precautions on the unit. For example, the handles are, uh, the door handles are beveled, the furniture is bolted in their rooms, any personal items that they bring with them that are kept in locked lockers that are on the unit, so, and even the trash bags on the unit are not plastic, they are uh, paper bags. So, just, uh, just different safety precautions, so the adolescents don't have the opportunity to hurt themselves. Um, that, that being said, um, with 
usually there's always underlying issues why they're trying to harm themselves or someone else. There's usually mental illness involved and also other symptoms such as impulsivity or suicidal ideation or maybe lack of support from their family environment. So I was on the unit five hours a week. Three of those hours were our clinical contact hours. Um, the adolescents, you know, they don't have phones and they, they have no music on the unit. They can watch TV, but that helps me a lot and helps music therapy on the unit because they look forward to actually having some sort of musical interaction. So um, I'm going to focus on uh, the adolescent groups for this presentation. But you see I also saw children as well once a week for an hour. Um, I stuck with the music psychotherapy session structure. I would usually introduce myself first and talk about the confidentiality of the group and also introduce group rules. I used an acronym SOAR, like feeling like you're flying, which stood for support, openness, authenticity, and respect. And we'd usually have a, a little discussion about authenticity, what does that mean, or some of, the, some of those other terms. And the group would agree to those rules. We talk about the purpose of the group and of music therapy in general sometimes, and then do some sort of icebreaker activity, much like the one we started off with today, to introduce names or mood or, ha or that in relationship to maybe one of their favorite artists or songs in a musical context to get started. I would then do a TME. Sometimes it would be, um, I would usually have two TMEs planned, therapeutic music experiences. One would be more invigorating, and one would be more relaxing, and I would try to uh, structure the, the session that way. And then I would usually close with group rounds, talking about um, uh, eliciting supportive comments from the group, and also transferring what we learn in the group to the rest of their life uh, post-session. So these two goals are for individuals. I would choose an individual in the group, and Look at first impulse control, which is inhibiting a behavior based on an external cue, and also following directions with limited prompting. I find these two work well, complement each other well, because most of the clients in the group are either withdrawn, and so they, they need that extra help to follow directions to participate in the group, or they're hyperactive. They are drawing attention to themselves, and so they need those activities to help encourage them to rein it in a little bit and to exercise that inhibition. These two goals and objectives work for the group as a whole. So mood can be split up into arousal and valence, and I chose to focus on arousal, as you can see. And also, if you need to refer to the goals and objectives, they're also written on the handout, I believe. OK, good. <laughs> okay. So the other goal uh, was uh, for communication, a supportive comment to help raise self-esteem and improve communi communication with the peers. So I want to talk about the rationale uh, behind two of the objectives, since that's what I'll have time for. And we're going to start with the moderation of emotional arousal. So uh, I'm going to look at this in a rational science scientific mediating model within that framework, uh, looking at the research uh, behind that. So there are three parts to arousal, alertness, the motor aspect, and emotional reactivity. And the optimal arousal theory states that as you increase in arousal, that your motivation to participate in a task also increases. Now that's only up to a certain point. Once you get too high, you're too hyperactive or you're too anxious to actually perform well on that task. So if you notice, I'm actually starting with the non-musical first, and that's because I wanted to really be able to define arousal for you and we kind of know what we're looking at, it puts it in a context when we start talking about the music. But still con continuing the discussion of the non-musical, the, aut the autonomous nervous system is responsible for regulating arousal. So the sympathetic nervous system really for that fight or flight response, and you see all these different responses within the body, and it's the opposite for the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, what physiological measures are involved in music listening? So, the relationship between music and arousal is not exactly clear-cut. But basically, this slide is to show what changes in the body do happen when someone is listening to music. And so you see that music can affect skin conductance, which is basically related to how much a person is sweating on the skin. Skin temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, vascular response, like blood pressure. 
So these are all the physiological changes we see when you listen to music, depending on the type of music. And they all overlap with typical arousal changes within the nervous system. It's the same ner nervous system. So um, there are most likely more uh, physiological responses in this, but just from the research that I'm citing within this presentation, then these are the ones that I'm listing for now. So, but it's not a comprehensive list. Now, here are uh, a few level three studies. Essentially, what is the effect of music on arousal? Although, in a few different ways. The first article, the Judd and Ricard article, is actually the effect of grazing arousal on memory, so it's uh, on cognition, but music was used to raise arousal. And I wanted to use this study because there's not a lot of studies looking at using music to raise arousal. Most of them are actually for relaxation, which are these last two. Even instrument learning and playing is, uh, has a relaxing effect on the body and music listening. And that's these studies in particular. We also have a wonderful uh, study, a uh, doctoral dissertation by Dr. Sinan Moore. Um, um, so, well, kudos to doing uh, amazing research that's very needed. This, music, this musical contour regulation facilitation basically helping children regulate high and low arousal states by using different musical activities, alternating between them. And so basically the slide shows that music can help raise arousal, lower arousal, and also modulate between the two. Okay, so wipe your minds clean. That was one objective. <laughs> I'd like to show you the next, next objective, and then I'm going to give you a break and go into the TV. So, Hang with me for another two minutes here. I'm going to talk about inhibition, which is related to my objective of impulse control. You ready? <laughs> All right, because, yeah, I know this is when I've been blanking out, so I'll try not to. So. All right, inhibition is essentially suppressing actions to reach a goal. And in the study I cite here, it's measured by a go-no-go no go task. And you see the brain areas that this study found that are involved with this specific task. I'll let you memorize those now. <laughs> now looking at uh, instrument playing. So this is what I've decided to uh, compare to impulse control. Here we see that there are a number of networks of regions involved in instrument playing. This first study is interesting. It um, basically it shows when participants learn a song on the piano that they had not heard before, that these brain regions are involved. And the same re regions are activated when listening to the song after learning it. But if you listen to the song before you learn it, those motor regions are not involved. So it's pretty interesting. But we see uh, lots of uh, regions here involved with motor learning sequence. Some more, uh, two more studies here. I include a music listening study, one because music listening is involved in all musical tasks, essentially, and also because the orbital frontal cortex is important for the next slide, showing the overlap, and the superior temporal gyrus, which is where our primary auditory cortex is, I mean, it's just essential. It's where we're having the very basic processing of music um, before it goes to others, other areas of the brain. So we do see some overlap, and for me, this makes sense. When you think about playing a musical instrument, you know, there's a lot of motor actions involved. One for maybe getting the right fingering or playing the right note, but also playing notes at the, at the right time or in a certain rhythm. So temporally placing those. And so if you think about inhibition, you want to make sure that you're starting and stopping at the right times. So here's a wonderful study by Rickson, and it's comparing uh, both are uh, music therapy interventions, one with a uh, percussion ensemble with a performance focus, and one with an improvisation focus, which both help to improve impulsivity. So that's wonderful. Uh, however, there was no control group, um, just a side note to compare with, but we do need more studies in this area. Uh, Carolyn Dashinger, who was here at UM, has some wonderful basic research involving music and impulsivity, but still, um, I think it's intuitive but we do need uh, more research in this area. Great, do you have any questions up to this point? Okay, while well, it's fresh. Great, will my volunteers please come forward? All right, I'm going to present two different TMEs. Uh, this first one will be instrumental improvisation, which falls under uh, music att musical attention control training, which I struggled placing it there or an executive function. But I think inhibition really is a, a more basic 
uh, behavior, and that's why I decided to place it under tension. And then we'll have a more relaxing team meeting after this one. Um, as it says on there, my focus is listening. And which is uh, having their uh, musical sensory orientation training, but that's to be determined if it will stay in that category. So it's related really to my clinical project. <laughs> okay, go ahead and experiment with your instrument, see what different sounds it makes. Try it loud and soft. after me. how to make our own music together on the spot. We're going to lose, learn a few skills and then we're going to put them all together. Okay? So first I'm going to teach you a basic beat that you can use. So go ahead and repeat after me. Actually, I'm going to play this beat twice and then you can join in with me. I'm going to play a rhythm that you're going to repeat, and that's going to be the same way that we start and stop. So I'll play, and you'll replay it with me. We'll start our beat. Okay, so we're going to try it out with starting and stopping together, but this time I want us to listen to each other. We're going to start softly and practice something in music called a crescendo, which means, which is fancy language for getting louder, and a decrescendo for getting softer. Okay, so I'm going to bring us in. We're going to try it out. We have to listen to each other to do it together. Are you ready? <laughs> comes back in, someone else, myself, someone else needs to drop out. Allison's going to be the first person to not play. Okay? And so if she starts playing, one of us needs to drop out. Or if she starts playing, one of us needs to drop out. So we need to watch each other and make sure that more than one person doesn't stop and that one person's always not playing. Okay, does it make sense? <laughs> okay, no, sorry, I'll help you out. Okay. And we, you can use the basic beat that we just learned, but you can also do little variations with it, or you can make stuff up to go along with that beat, if you'd like, or you can just stick with the beat. But we're going to listen to each other, so we're loud or soft together, too. So a few things. Ready? You're not going to play? Okay. <laughs> but you are going to come in. Okay, great.
<laughs> Very good. Thank you guys. Awesome job. Although I think we ended with only two people playing, maybe? Okay. <laughs> Well, here, put your, put your instruments on the floor. Stay seated here. Okay. Just a couple of very quick questions. Okay. Did we start and end together? For the most part? I mean, did we start at the same time? After I started. Yeah. Did we follow the call and response correctly to start and end? In other words, my. In my yeah. So pretty good, pretty good. Okay. How did we do it though? One person not playing role. Yeah. <laughs> we did okay. Sometimes it was a little tricky knowing who was going out and coming in. Yeah, the transition was a little tough. It was a little difficult, but yeah. that's okay. You actually you actually did very very well in it. How do you feel like you sounded personally? Oh, I love the tambourines. Oh really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And what's something that you think another group member did well in today's activity? I noticed when I was going to come in for her turn to play, she would look around a little bit first, so it wasn't a surprise. Okay. So, thank you, Allison, for looking around. She's very attentive. She's constantly Okay, good. Yeah, great job. All right, guys, give yourselves a pat on the back. Great job. Hey, thank you. You can go sit back. All right, thank you, participantees. Um, I will now demonstrate the next therapeutic music intervention, mindful music listening. I'm going to play an instrumental, I'm going to play a song on the piano. And what I would like you to do is be my clients, if you don't mind. But you don't have to participate if you don't want to, but it'll be difficult not to. But anyway, <laughs> you can just sit there if you'd like. Okay, so next we're going to, going to try a listening exercise. And this particular exercise can be relaxing, it can be help be focusing. So what we're going to do is focus on the music itself. I'm going to play a song on the piano that you may or may not recognize. And adolescents would, would most likely recognize this song. And what I'd like you to do is if your mind wanders, if you start thinking about other things, maybe what you want to eat or what someone else said to you, or a story or something that just happened earlier today, if your mind wanders, and just gently bring it back to the music and to the actual sound of the piano. And one thing that kind of helps that you might try to do is imagine you're breathing in the sounds of the piano. Okay? And so that way, you're making breathing part of this listening exercise. And I want you to try that for the duration of listening, and then I'll have a couple questions right after.
First of all, great job, everyone. I didn't hear any talking. <laughs> I heard almost no movement. It sounded like everyone was at least quiet, which is a really great way to help your mind focus. If your body is moving less, sometimes that can help your mind move less as well. So just a couple of quick questions. Now that we're back in the room, okay, after the song. Mm. Okay, oh, that's right. So, does, does anyone recognize what song that was? Christine? Good Life. Yeah, good Life by Warren Republic. Yes. Okay. And what would you uh, say the mood or the vibe of the song is? Contentment. Okay. Uplifting. Uplifting. Okay. That's an uplifting back. Great. And does your mind or does your body feel any different after doing that music listening than before? Any changes? Some people nodding their head yes. Anything? Yeah. So a little relaxed. Mm -hmm. okay. So that might be an example of what I would do with the adolescents also, is um, having appropriate song choice and giving clear instructions. And they are capable of sitting still that long, as I've done it with them a couple times. <laughs> and they do stay on task. They say the music helps them really stay in the moment. And we're able to have a discussion afterward, and people have different experiences with that, uh, kind of similar to this one. So thank you for participating. I'm going to continue. Looking at the data of the two objectives that I talked about within the RSMM. So this is uh, the data for impulsivity. The red line shows the red line shows the uh, basically if the objective was met, that shows the three times. And so the objective was met 15 out of the, out of the 20 sessions that I have data for. Uh, some TMEs you can see were more effective for encouraging impulse control. For example, on 9.15, that was the second time we had done the group improvisation, which was very similar to what you saw today. Um, on 11.3, uh, which also has a lot, that was a, a movement with music activity. And some were less effective. For example, on 10.19, that was a, we did a lyric substitution over a song called Beautiful, and that particular team did not have a lot of impulse control just inherent in it. Here you see group averages before and after of emotional arousal. Essentially, at the beginning of the session, I would pass around a whiteboard and they could indicate uh, between very low, low, moderate, high, or very high what their arousal level was, and I would record again at the end of the session. So the goal was to, was to have the arousal level be closer to a moderate level, so not, not too low, not too high. In terms of that, I have met the objective 9 out of the 18 sessions because either the energy level rose higher than it was low or it actually lowered if it already was low. So, but, um, so there's some interesting points I'd like to make about this. First, the adolescents are typically coming from nap time. So you see that usually the group energy level is low. But you might also expect that from this population even if they weren't coming from nap time. It just adds to it. But the overall average of the arousal state before and after, if I summarize all the group averages, is before is 2.66 and after is 3.00. So that's, that was interesting. But also, 14 out of the 18 sessions, their arousal did increase, some more than others. And on the ones where it did decrease, I actually found that three of those four were somewhat less well received by the group. They, were, they seemed less effective. For example, one of them was a fill-in-the-blank guided visualization that the group was just fairly restless and was not into it at all. Um, another one was a storm recreation using in instruments to create sounds from the storm. Um, so, and that's another one where the energy decreased. But uh, so, just interesting things from measuring the arousal of, of the sessions. I did learn a lot during this graduate practicum. It's the most time I've ever spent with a clinical population. Uh, first of all, there is an adjustment period, at least for me there was, about hearing about the family lives and individual struggles that these children and adolescents face. It was quite shocking at first. It took me several weeks to adjust to that. I, 
as I mentioned, I go to team meetings, and that's kind of their everyday language. But for someone being initiated into this population, you really, you really have to get used to it. But now I'm glad I've gone through that, because I feel like moving forward with this population, I'm prepared to be able to discuss those types of issues, and it's not going to be quite as surprising. 